without uh, losing uh, much time, so we're running, I think, late in the schedule. We're going to turn to the second part, so we're going to hear uh, exciting things about the ongoing uh, clinical trial and translational research ongoing within the program, starting with uh, Dr. Jason Luke, uh, who is a member of the program, or Dr. Davar or Dr. Luke. My program say Dr. Luke, Jason, right? Um, who is a member of the program and also director of the new uh, Cancer Immunotherapy Center at the Human Cancer Center, and has recently opened a series of very uh, exciting uh, novel trial to uh, try to improve uh, uh, you know, the outcome uh, and to do better than current immunotherapy of, uh, of melanoma. So Jason, up to you. Great. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today on this program. And I think that the previous talk was an excellent introduction. Just to confirm, do I need to swap the slides over? Are you guys seeing the right screen? Yeah, perfect. There you go. Okay. Um, so thank you and apologies there for a little technical problem, but we'll try to catch up. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about unmet needs for high-risk melanoma today and just start with uh, disclosures on my part. Um, I work on a lot of early phase clinical trials, which uh, means a lot of interactions with uh, pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies that are developing new drugs. So quickly today, what I'm hoping to go over uh, is first just to have a very brief discussion about melanoma biology. And I think the previous talk actually set this up quite well, so you should be able to go through that fairly quickly. And then, uh, as was mentioned, talk about some next steps and therapeutic approaches for unmet need populations in melanoma. So what about those patients who get anti-PD-1, like nivolumab or pembrolizumab, but then it isn't as effective as we had hoped? What about patients who present with very high risk disease uh, at the time of their initial diagnosis, such as brain and liver metastases, or high levels of the lactate dehydrogenase in the blood, as well as refractory disease for patients who have tried uh, other uh, treatment approaches. So just quickly to set the stage, and you know this from just the preceding talk, we kind of think about splitting treatment for melanoma into two categories as it currently stands. And one is around uh, molecularly targeted or precision medicine approaches to, uh, targeting BRAF. Uh, and as was probably discussed, uh, canonical mitogen activated protein kinase signaling is through a receptor on the surface of the cell down through a series of proteins that are known as RAS, RAF, MEC, and ERK. And there's some complicated biology that regulates this, which isn't really the point right now. But suffice it to say that in 50% of melanomas, this BRAF gene becomes mutated a very specific way such that it's no longer interacting with the upstream aspects of the uh, signaling cascade. And for that reason then, uh, this becomes a good therapeutic target because blocking this in a precision fashion can actually be specific or nearly specific for the cancer. And people are aware that we use combinations of BRAF and MEK inhibitors. On the other side of the coin are the immunotherapies or checkpoint blocking immunotherapies that we now uh, have as a standard option. And uh, we don't have time to go through all of the biology, but essentially they come in sort of two different types. Um, Ipilimumab or, um, is the, one of the common drugs that's been around a while. And essentially what this does is tries to turn off the off switch. So it blocks this molecule CTLA-4, which regulates the immune, the on and off aspect of the immune system really on a high level. And that's in contrast on the bottom right where you see the PD-1, PD-L1 interaction of infiltrating T cells getting to the tumor but getting blocked. And if we block this interaction, we can sort of wake up these T cells so they can try to kill the cancer. And in that context, we've had just a tremendous change in the overall landscape of therapeutic approaches for melanoma over the last 10 years, such that when I started my career uh, around 2011, chemotherapy and high-dose interleukin-2 were really the only options. And now, as was just reviewed, there are many different options available for patients, ranging from BRAF-targeted agents, immunotherapies, viral therapies, combinations of these approaches, and the future is really quite bright. Uh, I like going back to this. This is the uh, AJCC staging system curves for metastatic melanoma from about 2010. Uh, and back then, the outcomes for patients were not nearly what we would hope. And you can see that patients who had cancer that had spread the M1C here into multiple parts of the body, their survival over time you can see years on the bottom axis here, would drop precipitously. And I don't have time to review everything except to say that at this point, we expect even with standard of care approaches that at least 50% of patients should be alive out through five years who have advanced metastatic melanoma. But of course, that's not really the point of my talk today, but rather I'm here to sort of discuss open questions in melanoma for refractory disease. 
So what about those patients who have progression on anti-PD-1, such as nivolumab or pembrolizumab, in the adjuvant space, meaning after they had their surgery, they got immunotherapy, but the melanoma came back anyway? So it's an open question as to whether or not to give ipilimumab alone or to add ipilimumab on top of a PD-1 antibody. And in that regard, we have some historical experience from clinical trials. The Keynote 006 study was the randomized phase three trial, which compared pembrolizumab versus ipilimumab. But for those patients who progressed on pembrolizumab, a subset of them did get ipilimumab secondarily. And in this trial, you can see that about 13% of patients in this clinical trial had a response, I mean, their tumor shrank some substantially, getting ipilimumab after pembrolizumab. Now, we were interested to ask the question, what if we add the ipilimumab on top of the pembrolizumab? And we recently completed a phase two clinical trial of continuing pembrolizumab after progression and adding a lower dose of ipilimumab to see those outcomes. And you can see the schematic here, patients get PD-1 antibody like nivolumab or pembrolizumab, and then they go on to have the combination instead of just ipilimumab alone. And this is work that I predominantly did before I came to uh, UPMC in Chicago uh, and has been driven by my fellow, uh, Daniel Olson, who's now on the faculty at the University of Chicago. And we recently presented this data and are in the process of publishing it now. Uh, and what we observed is this Kaplan-Meier survival plot, where individual patients' tumors are tracked as the up or down lines. And what you can see is that a substantial number of them over here on the right, about 30% of them, had their tumors shrink dramatically. And so again, that 30% is more than double what we would have expected historically from ipilimumab alone. And what we'd highlight on the right-hand side are that several of these patients are out now out many years on their treatment. And so this is quite exciting and it suggests that we can raise the bar, so to say, by using standard of care agents that we already have, perhaps in a more nuanced way. On a translational level, what we were very interesting, interested to observe was that the responding patients disproportionately seem to be those that we would otherwise not expect to respond to immunotherapy in the first place. So using what's called gene expression profiling, where we actually look at which genes are turned on for all the genes in the genome via uh, something called uh, RNA sequencing, we saw that those tumors that lacked T cells or only had a medium amount of T cells were those who disproportionately would have a complete partial response or stable disease. And again, this is very interesting because I think this uh, suggests that we can meet an unmet need in melanoma by overcoming non T cell inflamed tumors using the combination of PD-1 and low dose CTLA-4. And so based on these data, as well as data from the Melanoma Institute Australia, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines have now incorporated and referenced these data to support the use of pembrolizumab plus low dose ipilimumab in the second line after PD-1 failure. Well, I'll go on to a second question then that builds on that previous data. Can we use biomarkers to help us think about which patients need more aggressive approaches? And I mentioned at the beginning that patients who have brain and liver metastases or elevated LDH are at increased risk of treatment, uh, of treatment failure. In addition, I just alluded to how patients with high levels of interferon expression uh, or tumor mutational burden are those who disproportionately benefit. So what about people with low levels of those? In this realm, um, it's good to go back to some recent uh, data in the field, which is to show that in patients treated with immune therapy with PD-1, nivolumab or pembrolizumab, it's quite clear now, like I said, that those with high levels of T cell inflamed gene expression, as well as more mutations in their tumor, are those who disproportionately are likely to be responder patients versus non-responder patients. And very interestingly, in the phase two portion of the COMBI-I clinical trial, combining BRAF and MEK and PD-1 inhibitors all together, what was observed was those patients who had the least benefit to treatment, again, were those people who had low levels of this T cell inflamed gene signature and low levels of the tumor mutational burden. So while this triplet approach is considered an approved modality, I think few people use it in clinical practice because of this problem, which is that it doesn't seem to address the patients who have the highest unmet need. The other thing I'll highlight quickly are that very high risk populations of patients with melanoma remain in need of better treatments. And particularly those patients who have brain metastases and who require steroids or other interventions. 
And what I'm showing here is the response rate for these patients who get standard treatments. And you can see with immunotherapy, the rates of response are very low, less than 10%. With the brafinib and trametinib with BRAF and MEK inhibitors, responses are common, but unfortunately they don't tend to last very long. More recently with ipilimumab and nivolumab together, we've seen a, a, a substantial improvement for those patients who have brain metastases but are not symptomatic. However, for those patients who are symptomatic, meaning that they need the steroids or other interventions, the response rate's very low, uh, on the order of about 20% uh, or lower. And this raises the overall question of which patients are at highest risk. This was a nice uh, a workflow that was published a few years ago uh, around a clinical trial of BRAF and MEK inhibitors, showing that patients who have high LDH really drives uh, a difference in the outcomes of patients. This is a blood marker that all of you will probably remember that we check. And then liver metastases also disproportionately drive a uh, lack of benefit to treatment, as well as patients who have overall more cancer in their body. And we call this the sum of longest diameters. And so all of this probably makes sense. All of these things are, are uh, associated with aggressive biology and patients do less well. And I don't have time to go into all the details, but here at UPMC, uh, working with my fellow uh, Max Jamison Lee, we've designed a clinical trial to try to look at how would we leverage at the intersection of all these different treatments, these different modalities. So we're doing a clinical trial combining BRAF uh, inhibitors plus PD-1 and low-dose CTLA-4, as well as BRAF and MEK inhibitors plus PD-1 and uh, low-dose CTLA-4. So a triplet and a quadruplet with the idea that we would apply this only in those high-risk populations of brain metastases and elevated LDH or liver metastases, as I noted. And this is a clinical trial that we'll be doing collaboratively. It's being uh, led through UPMC, but is going to be opened at Sloan Kettering, the Dana-Farber, and BCU Massey Cancer Center. One final point to just touch on, or what about the patients who unfortunately have all of those treatments, but then seem to progress through all of them anyway, and how do we get immunotherapy to work in those patients? Uh, so here we talk about restoring dendritic cell function. And the fundamental predicate for why immunotherapy works, we think, is that our immune systems can notice that cancer is present through dendritic cells, which can then prime the tumor, uh, prime the, lymph, the immune system, I should say, and then send immune cells out to the tumor. Uh, and this is manifest on the right-hand side, these two plots where we see some patient's tumors have high levels of CD8 T cells, and therefore all the other things we think about in inflamed tumors, as opposed to non-T cell inflamed tumors, which lack all of this. And our lab uh, has worked bioinformatically to reanalyze data from previous clinical trials. And just due to time, I can't go over all of it. But suffice it to say that we've noticed that one of the strongest associations between people who benefit from immunotherapy, these PRs and CRs, is at baseline to have high levels of certain dendritic cells in their tumor. And in fact, these go up over time. And there's an emerging literature from mouse modeling to suggest that there's a, dy a dynamism uh, where these cells are active both to get treatment started and to maintain the effect of immunotherapy over time. So targeting these dendritic cells is a high priority. And there's a drug, there are drugs out there that might be useful to target dendritic cells, and I won't go over everything on this slide due to time, but suffice it to say that the P38 MAP kinase might be an important molecule in regulating this. And we've been very interested in looking at mouse modeling, combining P38 inhibitors with immunotherapy. And in two different cell lines, what we see is that if we add this inhibitor with PD-1 or CTLA-4, we see a disproportionate improvement in the benefit in terms of holding cancer at bay in these mice. And that's led us to this clinical trial that we're pursuing now, combining a drug called Array614 with either nivolumab or ipilimumab. And this trial is focused on melanoma as well as kidney cancer. And we're pursuing this in conjunction with our cancer pharmacology colleague, uh, Jan Boomer, as well as other colleagues. And so this clinical trial is in the process of being opened in the Harvard system, as well as at VCU Massey with a number of different collaborators. So with that, I'm gonna conclude and note that after progression on anti-PD-1, apologies for the typo, adding ipilimumab onto PD-1 appears to be more active than ipilimumab alone. But unmet needs remain for high risk and refractory disease and continuing combin combining BRAF and MEK inhibitors with immunotherapy remains of interest. And jumpstarting dendritic cell activity may have the potential to reverse resistance to immunotherapy. And as I noted, we have clinical trials ongoing for patients in these scenarios at UPMC Hillman right now. 
And there's much to do still in the management of melanoma. Uh, and uh, obviously we appreciate all of you participating today and consideration of participation in these clinical trials as we noted with them. And with that, I'll just say thank you, acknowledge my funding sources, uh, and always give a shout out to our uh, blues band called the Checkpoints, which is made up of a number of cancer immunotherapy researchers. Uh, we missed seeing each other in 2020, but I'm looking forward to uh, possibly seeing them all again by the end of the year or certainly in uh, 2022. So with that, I'll say thanks very much and stop sharing my screen and happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you so much, Jason. Very exciting uh, talk. And uh, it's nice to see that, uh, you know, we are capable of uh, providing uh, you know, new opportunity for patients to do better than the current immunotherapy of cancer. 